Mark chapter 5, I feel like I'm in a tunnel this morning. I've had a earache for about three weeks, and the last 48 hours is just sort of gone like this on me, and um, my wife is sticking onions in my ear. Does anyone ever do that? Yeah, I smell like a hamburger yesterday. <laughs> it's supposed to draw the infection out, I guess and she's pouring silver in there. I'm saying I just need antibiotics, uh, but we got silver and onions and massaging and what else did you put on me? Different oils and rub it in. And so it really crescendoed, right? At about, about midnight last night, it really peaked for me. And uh, finally it just popped and I got a bunch of stuff running out of my ear, but I guess it's going to heal now. But for now, it feels like I'm in a tunnel and so um, I hope I don't sound as goofy as I think I sound, because when you're in a tunnel, you know, you, it just doesn't sound right. This isn't normal. But um, I often ask the Lord just to help me lose myself in the message and not care about what I sound like and not care about what I look like and just try to convey the truth that he would have me to preach. So if you could pray for me to that end today, that would be a blessing for sure. But Mark chapter 5, if you're there, would you stand with me? And I will read verses 21 through 34. Mark chapter 5, verse 21 through 34. And the Bible says here, And when Jesus was passed over again by ship unto the other side, much people gathered unto him, and he was nigh unto the sea. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. And Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood twelve years, and had suffered many things of many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and sayest thou who touched me? And he looked round about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace, and be whole of thy plague. Wonderful passage of scripture. Two people desperately seeking the Lord Jesus, Jairus leading the Lord Jesus, and of course this woman who had this issue of blood for 12 years, desperately seeking the garment of Jesus, finds that she is healed. And not only that, finds that she is saved. I love how the Lord calls her daughter. She's now a child of God. Her faith has made her whole. I want to talk to you a little bit today about life-changing faith. Life-changing faith. And let's have a word of prayer today. Father, we thank you now for this passage. Dear God, we pray that you'd speak to our hearts through it. Lord, as we break down the sort of the context of the story and the different verses that lie in it, Lord, may we find ourselves in this lady. May we find ourselves in this ruler of the synagogue. 
And may we, Lord, come desperately to you, seeking help and seeking the power of God in our own life. Speak through our hearts so that we would change and grow because of this time today. And Lord, if there's somebody here today that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, somebody that's been struggling against the Spirit of God and hasn't allowed the Spirit of God to not only bring that conviction, but to regenerate the Spirit within them. Lord, today may, may it be the day of their salvation. May they get saved. May they open up their heart's door and ask Jesus to come in and forgive them of their sin and truly be their Savior. Bless today, I pray, in Jesus' name, amen. And you may be seated. Several setbacks in this story, certainly a setback and a trial for this lady here in the story. You know, life is full of setbacks, isn't it? It seems like every week something is going on, either in our life or in the lives of those that we know and love. Some people say that you're either uh, just come out of a trial or you're in the midst of a trial or you're about to go into a trial. Uh, life is full of trials, it's full of struggles. Sometimes it's fun just to laugh, amen? And sometimes it does our heart good. It does us good like a medicine to laugh. Um, so I'll tell you a few jokes, amen? Uh, have you heard about the dairy cow that tried to jump over the barbed wire fence? It was an utter disaster. <laughs> Did you hear about the man that fell into the furniture upholstery machine? He's fully recovered. <laughs> or how about the butcher that backed into his meat grinder while he was working? He's a little behind in his work now. <laughs> Doesn't that do good for your heart? Amen? <clears throat> it does as good like a medicine to laugh. And I always say it's okay to smile in church. It's okay to say amen. It's okay to get excited when the Holy Spirit speaks to your heart and let some of that joy out. When, when Brother Jordan's singing up here, there's a special up here, and the Spirit moves you, lift up your Bibles and say amen. Say glory to God. Say hallelujah. That's all fine. Surely this lady was saying that after she was touched, after she was healed, after she was saved, and God got hold of her, I'm sure that she was excited about it all. Number one in our bulletins today, suffering is a part of life, but Jesus gives us hope. Aren't you glad about that? Suffering is a part of, anybody going through a trial right now? Amen, amen. You can see yourself in this lady then and in one of the myriad ways that she is suffering. Yeah, it used to be in the old days that you would only hear bad news through the daily newspaper or the evening news. Isn't that right? You'd get that daily paper, and I used to deliver it, and I used to see that front page first thing every morning at 5 o'clock, and, and I would be one of the first in the know. And uh, certainly there's somebody else in that, uh, a different time period than me that was getting it before me but later on in the day of course we'd go to school and my parents would go to work and there'd be the five o'clock evening news CBC in Canada and we would sit down and we would try to find out what happened around the world or in our city that day and it seemed like it was always bad news it just seems like bad news sells and today we live in a day and age where we're never far away from bad news. Anybody been following the 12 boys stuck in a cave in Thailand? And last I heard, four of them, they've gotten out. I don't know if they've gotten any more by now, but, but uh, we know the bad news right away as soon as it happens. Reminds me of the man that worked all day and, and he had a tough, hard day and he came home and his wife was caring for the three preschoolers that they had and she looked completely flustered when he walked in. He just knew she was fixing to unload on him about some of the things that had happened that day. And so he said, honey, before you say anything, I had a terrible day at work today and everything went wrong. 
please don't tell me any more bad news, just good news. And so she said, okay, you have three children and two of them didn't fall off the roof and break both their arms today. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that's good news. Amen. That's good news. You know, that's why I like the Bible. You know, all this bad news out in the world, but we can go to the word of God and we can find good news. We can understand as we live our lives that suffering is an integral part of life. But Jesus truly gives us hope. In this story, there's a lot of bad news. On the onset, it just looks like it's bad news. Bad. Everyone's trying to get to Jesus. They all have troubles. They all have struggles. And there's this poor lady that is truly suffering. I mean, she's been suffering physically from a lack of blood coagulation for 12 years. Can you imagine? 12 years. It's 2018 right now. Back it up 12 years. So from say 2006, every day she's been struggling. She's broke physically. She's at the end of her rope. She's at the end of her tether. She's suffering not only physically, but she's suffering financially. She's gone to every doctor she can find, right? None of them have done right by her. Most of them in this time period are just really magicians trying different things. They've taken all of her money. She spent it all. And she hasn't gotten any better. She's only gotten worse. The Jewish Talmud, it's, it's a, a, a book of ancient cures that came out in the first 600 years after Christ. Um, is she, she could have gotten into that. One of the cures in that is you take a duck egg, a large duck egg, and you crack it open, and then you bake and burn the contents and the shell into ashes. You take the ashes, you put it in a linen bag, and you hang it around your neck, and that's somehow supposed to bring a cure to you. She had probably tried the duck egg thing. No wonder we call them quacks, amen? <laughs> but she was suffering. She couldn't find any hope. She was suffering physically. She was suffering financially. She was suffering socially. I mean, here, anybody that had a blood disorder like this in that time frame, they were considered unclean. Whatever she sat on, whatever bed she laid on, whatever person touched her was considered unclean. She wasn't even supposed to be out in the crowd that day. And if she was, she was supposed to declare herself unclean, unclean. It's pretty hard to make friends that way, man. Suffering. Maybe you can relate to her today. Maybe you're suffering physically today. I know I am. Maybe you're suffering financially today or suffering socially today. This past week, I played the boys a song from, I don't know, maybe the 50s by the Coasters. It's uh, the song Charlie Brown. And it's got the funny lyrics in it. Charlie Brown, what a clown. And then it's got that one line. Why is everybody always picking on me? And you may feel like that today. Because suffering is a part of life. But aren't you glad that Jesus gives us hope? He's not going to remove the suffering. It's part of life. He intends for us to suffer, to grow us. And I think the sooner we embrace the hardships of life, the sooner we're driven to the Lord Jesus Christ and we find that there is hope in him. Maybe not always a physical cure or a financial miracle or a social miracle, but surely there's always hope to be found in the Lord Jesus. Who is the greatest spokesman, do you think, for Christianity beside the Lord Jesus? John the Baptist. John the Baptist, that's a good one. But for Christianity more, not he was sort of the middle ager. He introduced the Lamb of God. Paul the Apostle. Paul the Apostle. Did he suffer? Yeah. Well, he had some sort of thorn in the flesh that he besought the Lord. Take this. I could do so much more for you if you would just take this from me. And he said unto him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, My grace is sufficient for thee, 
For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Suffering is God's way of making us stronger. Amen? Embrace it. Thank the Lord for it. I know that's hard, but you truly have to believe that suffering's a part of life, but Jesus gives us hope for you to embrace it and thank the Lord for it. You ever seen a golf ball and Rick looked really close at it? You know how it has all those dimples all over it? Did you know that the Scots that invented that game started that game with a small, smooth ball? They just figured, hey, a smooth ball is going to fly better than a dimpled ball. Makes sense, doesn't it? But as they played the game, they discovered as it got chipped up a bit and as it got scratched a little bit, it would actually go further. And so the professionals started carving little divots out of their golf balls. And they found that it would go twice as far than a smooth ball. Isn't that a parable for our life? Amen. The Lord knows that those dings and those dents and those scratches are going to cause us to go further in life. I, I don't know the science behind it. I looked it up. I couldn't understand it, to tell you the truth. But it's got something to do with an aerodynamic principle where one uh, aerodynamic principle sort of counts, cancels out or lessens the other one, which would be the drag behind the ball. And it just works that way. And praise the Lord for it. Thank God for the sufferings that are part of life. And Jesus gives us hope. I want to give you four truths today. That was one of them from this story. The second truth is, and it's very, very obvious, casual contact with Christ is not the same as a desperate grasp of faith. Try to picture the scene with me, would you? Here we have Jairus. And, well, let me back it up a little bit. The Lord Jesus has just left the maniac of Gadara early in the chapter. He's healed him. He's cast out the devils in him. Now the folks see this man that no man could bind, that talked garbage, that looked naked all the time. They see him clothed and sitting in his right mind by the Lord Jesus. The crowd is so great that the Lord Jesus says, let me get on that boat and let's pass over to the other side. You gotta know that the Sea of Galilee isn't very big. That the crowd started to make their way around the other side. As the Lord Jesus got off of the boat, the crowd was there. They were waiting, they were looking, they were imagining what he could possibly do for them. The first person to meet the Lord Jesus is one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus. And he falls on his knees in front of the Lord Jesus and begs him there right in that moment, please come to my house. I'm begging you. My daughter is about to die. I want you to come and spare her life. I know if you'll just come and talk to her, if you'll just lay your hands on her, I know that she will live again. Please come. Please come. Please come. Wonderful. And so he says, I'll go. I'm coming. Let's go. Take me the direction. And so they start heading that way. And there's this lady that has this issue. There's this lady that is normally very feeble and very meek. It wasn't the kind probably to elbow her way through the crowd. But she wanted not to hear a special word from God that day, not to have her hands laid on by Jesus that day, but she figured if I can just get in there and grab a hold of his robe, that, that prayer shawl or whatever it was she grabbed onto, that that would be enough to heal with me. Look in Mark chapter 5, if you would. Mark chapter 5 and verse 27. It says here, when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. That word touched literally means to be attached to. Let me open this here. It's 
Stephen, come on up. It doesn't give you the connotation. Just walk slowly up. It doesn't give you the connotation that she came in behind the mob and just touched it. It literally means she attached herself to it like it was a life jacket. Like she desperately needed it. Like she needed whatever it was that the Lord Jesus had for her. Try not to strangle you on that one. And for the first time in 12 years, the bleeding stopped. She knew she was healed. Look down at verse 30. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? Can you see Peter rolling his eyes on this? The first time you read this story, did you think, what? I mean, Luke gives the description here that it was as if they were crushing him. That's how many people were there. There was people pressed up about him. They were thronging him, it says here in this passage. Dozens of people were touching Jesus, but it seemed like only one truly reached out with faith. This type of faith where it's not just a light touch, but this type of faith where I've got to attach to it like a life jacket. Jesus is here today. He says in his word, where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of him. We are gathered today in his name. He is right here in the midst of us. It is so similar to the crowd that day. There is a whole bunch of folks that come to church and they casually touch Jesus. They casually elbow him. They casually rub up against him. But there's one or two or maybe more that will say, no, I've got to have him. And they desperately reach out by faith and they attach themselves to him. Where are you in that crowd today? Because truly the key to grabbing hold of Jesus is to seek him with your whole heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with all your heart. Vance Havner, great preacher of years gone by, said about this lady. He said, mind you, this woman was shy and timid. She was not in habit of elbowing her way through the crowds. But when we are desperate enough, we'll do anything to get through to God. Our Lord said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Thirst is not casually wanting a drink of water. When we really thirst, water must be had and we will drive through any obstacle to get it. Christians do not drink of the living water because there is no burning, feverish, consuming thirst after God. The situation is desperate, but the saints are not. There was two kinds of people in this mob that day. Spectators and seekers. There were the folks that came and just wanted to watch. They wanted to see what was going to happen when Jesus got involved. Then there was those two that said, no, we need more than that. We need the Lord in our life. We need his power. We need a miracle. We need an answer to prayer. We need him at our house. We need him to come with us. We need his presence. Now, do you think there was other people in that crowd that had needs? Sure there was. But for some reason, they felt like they should just be spectators. 
Third truth I see in this story. There is a personal cost to Jesus in every spiritual transaction. Look with me, if you would, Mark chapter 5 and verse 30. It says, And Jesus immediately, knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned him about in the press and said, Who touched my clothes? In Luke... See, here it says, knowing within himself. He knew that within himself. Virtue had gone out of him. I don't know if you've ever looked at that word before, but that word virtue doesn't just mean good there. It's actually translated from the word dunamis, which means power. It's where we get our word dynamite. It also means strength. And so the Lord Jesus knew within himself that power had gone out of him. He told Peter in the book of Luke that he actually felt power flow out of him when she grabbed a hold of him with this life-saving faith. Could it be that every time Jesus did a miracle that power flowed out of him? Could it be that there's a personal cost to Jesus every time he did a spiritual transaction while he was on this earth? Could it be that when he stood at the tomb of Lazarus and he said, Lazarus, come forth, that power was flowing out of him and it was the power of God that raised him that day? Could it be the power of God that unstopped the deaf ears and undid the blind eyes? Could it be the power of God that flowed through his body and there was actually a personal cost to Jesus Every time he performed a miracle. I'd say so. He told Peter, I literally felt power go out of me. Thank you, Lord. Herschel Hobbs, the, uh, he was a pastor and an author. He was at First Baptist Church, Oklahoma City for 25 years. His doctor would often tell him that preaching a 30-minute sermon was likened to working an eight-hour shift at a factory. It just drained you physically and emotionally. And, and anybody that's ever taught the Word of God knows that's the case. It just, you're drained physically, emotionally, spiritually. You're spent. There's a movie called The Green Mile that came out several years ago. Stephen King, very twisted. It was about a, a group of folks that were on death row. And Tom Hanks was one of the stars of the movie. And, and a man named John Coffey, he was the black guy in that movie, uh, uh, Michael Duncan. He was the, the, in the cell right next to Tom Hanks. And Tom Hanks had this terrible bladder infection. And John Coffey had this ability to take the disease from the person just by laying his hands on them and then he would like actually emit like insects and things out of his mouth and after he was done he just had to rest it got me thinking how much power flowed out of our Lord on that cross you got me thinking what he did with my sins and how he didn't let insects out of his mouth after he touched me, but he took my sins and he took them all the way to the cross. It made me think of Isaiah 53 where it says, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was buried for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. With his stripes we are healed. This took it all upon us. There was a great personal cost to Jesus in the spiritual transaction of salvation. Because a holy God must punish sin. And the wages of sin is death and hell forever. Jesus tasted hell 
on that cross. Hell is torment, so he was tormented on that cross. Hell is separation, so he realized real separation from the Father on the cross when he cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? A great personal cost to our Savior. A huge price. And yet salvation is free to us. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Aren't you grateful? The fourth truth I see here in the story is Jesus asks us to openly confess him before others. You have to realize when Jesus asked, who touched me or who touched my clothes? It's in a few different of the Gospels. He wasn't asking for information. He knew who it was. Fully God and fully man. He knew who touched him. But when he said, who touched me or who touched my clothes, he was addressing a lady that he didn't wish to embarrass but a lady who, if she could, would slink back into the crowd. She was content to, to be a closet Christian. She was content to be a secret believer. She was content just to slip back into the crowd after she was healed, after she was saved. But Jesus wasn't going to let that happen. Because he wants us to openly confess him before others and when she was afraid and when she realized what had been done in her she came and she threw herself down at the feet of Jesus and she told her story you know what that did for the others it encouraged them doesn't it encourage you to hear what Jesus has done for somebody else Jesus wants you to share that one of the first ways we openly confess our belief to others in the Christian faith is we get baptized. While that candidate is down in the water, I ask, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And they get to say, I have. Or they say no and we've got to get them back out of the water and make sure they understand. We went to uh, Jerusalem on an Israel trip, Andrea and I. And you wouldn't believe the atmosphere there. When we got near the Jordan River, others in our group were, were they found out I was a pastor, a missionary, and, and all the chatter started to become, uh, do you think he'd baptize us? Would he baptize us? Can we reconfirm our baptism through him? There was this spirit of, of I want to openly confess. I want to testify through this. I want to get baptized in the same place that Jesus was probably baptized. I want to part. Everybody was encouraged. Everybody was stirred. Nobody was ashamed. Nobody was slipping down into the crowd. It was exciting. And so my question for you today is, where are you in the crowd? Are you a spectator? Or are you a seeker? Oh, you can touch Jesus, but not get that life-changing power, it seems. If you would bow your heads with me and just close your eyes this morning. I found a prayer along this lines, and I just want to read it to you today. God, I know that only those who suffer greatly reach out to grasp you. People who have nothing to offer but the faith that you can make them whole. I confess, Lord, how often I have followed you in the crowd and it's all pressed around you. Yet how few times have those brushes with you changed my life. I have touched you but only in the rush hour of religious activity. Sunday after Sunday, I take my part in the crowd as I sit through the service. 
I sing the hymns, I hear the sermon, I read my Bible, I say my prayers, I give my money. How could I be so close to your presence, yet so far from your power? Could it be that my arms are folded? Could it be that my hands are full? I pray that my arms are complacent. You would unfold them in outstretched longing for you. And if my hands are full, I pray that you would empty them so that I might cling only to you.